You already know where we are. I've said it before every show. We've just finished all of them. I want you to enjoy the interviews from people that you will not believe some of the personal things they're going to share with you. Their books, their testimony, every part of this program you will enjoy. Please sit back, enjoy what God has in store for you. Thank you for watching. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for joining us, all you folks that are watching, wherever you're watching. We are still in Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee. This is the 2013 NRB. National Religious Broadcasters Convention. And when we, first, every year. when we first started coming here, they had a 10-year contract at the Opryland Hotel. Yes. I think it's running out. I don't know. I Maybe a year or two left. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but we have a, a good friend. I mean, yes. This girl not only is beautiful, <laughs> Very beautiful. inside also, inside but, and out. but we see her on Fox quite often. You've seen her beautiful face uh, on uh, secular television and she holds news her media. Own too. Oh my goodness, what a, <laughs> what a mind she has! And, and I we've, love, we've had ahead. the privilege of having her on uh, more than one time because I love somebody that when you talk to them they really do know what they're talking about that's right so and listen they have carefully. passion too and i love her name yes star we know one star yes star parker <laughs> <laughs> she's the founder and president of cure the coalition for urban renewal and education with headquarters in washington dc she also was uh, you can tell us what that is when we talk to you and oh, yes. she was also a candidate uh, for a Republican, a Republican candidate in 2010, I remember that, and mm -hmm. ran for office. And you've got to have lots of guts to try that out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey. And back, in fact, Dr. Ben Carson mm -hmm. is on your Cure board. Oh, yes, wonderful. Yes, he's on what do you think of that? I think I'm impressed. I mean, well. I mean, did, did you happen to see that uh, presidential breakfast? The yes, breakfast? oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, that, it's viral now. Everybody's seeing it. Everybody's I mean, seen it. He, uh, President Obama's body language. <laughs> right, right. That's what I was watching. I think that now people think because Dr. Carson is on our advisory board that now I'm his personal assistant. So I've heard from every one of my <laughs> friends who knows he's on the board to ask me, can they get him booked? And I thought, oh, maybe I'll leave a long list and then I'll take know, it up yeah, to Baltimore right. one day. <laughs> Star, I just found this out. I was watching some news media. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize they were trying to get his talking speech. points. His yeah. speech, yeah. And he kept telling them, I don't use notes, right, so right. I I talk impromptu. Right. I don't use prompters. Right, I, right. A, so they couldn't get it. Well, yeah. that's why because I couldn't understand if they yeah. read what he was going to say. Right, right. He would have been nixed before he hit the platform. Well, I think that um, that was a perfect platform to say what he needed to yeah, say. Absolutely. When you think about a prayer breakfast, if we can't talk about issues of religion and deeply held beliefs in our country in a religious platform in a prayer breakfast, then where do we talk about exactly it? Exactly So right. I'm just very proud of him and that he does work with Cure when he gets an opportunity and that he's loaned us his name so that we can up, do our work. Uh, yes. Star up front, mm -hmm. give me a synopsis of Cure. Cure is a center for urban renewal and education and what we do is we promote market-based solutions to fight poverty. Uh, we, we try to restore dignity and fight poverty through messages of faith, freedom, and personal responsibility. Um, I consulted on federal welfare reform and we told the country what we should not be doing at that time. Five million women, nine million children, just totally in the grips of government dependency. So I found a cure to start addressing what we should be doing as a country when it comes to fighting poverty. You were on welfare. I was. In fact, I shared my story of seven years in and out of the welfare system, three and a half years consistently. Uh, during the time that we were trying to change welfare policy in this country in the 90s. Um, you know, I just believe the lie of the left, and I got caught in all kind of activities, from criminal to drugs to sexual promiscuity that landed me on welfare, and then a Christian conversion just totally changed my life. I, I received Christ, I went back to college, I got a degree, I started a business, wow. and after the 92 riots, when that business was destroyed, I began to focus on social reform. Uh, we, and so that's when I found a cure, basically, in my heart but I filed the paperwork a few years later. <laughs> I've, I've got to tell you, the website is on our screen, so use that, please write it down, but get her book, her schedule, where she is, and just be a prayer partner for Star Parker, because she's out there in that world <laughs> yeah, that you. has 
has darts coming at you. And prayer, make sure that there's a shield every time they get near her. Right, and thank you. You, you, yeah. you right now are really financially in need. Right. We just moved our headquarters in Washington, D.C. because the need is great in the community. When you think about what has happened to us as a society, some of these issues were brought up during the presidential. 47% of Americans are in some way government dependent. When we look at the Medicaid program that everyone is talking about now and the president passed Obamacare to put more people on it, Medicaid already pays for 40% of all births in our country and 60% of all long-term care for our seniors. This is a disaster. So our work is to get the message of freedom out there so that we can start reforming these entitlement programs before they totally collapse and bankrupt this country. Yeah. And the most vulnerable are the ones that will get hit the hardest. So our work is to inform these inner city pastors of, first of all, what crises is in front of them, and then to have the Nehemiah plead to them to please help us rebuild these communities so that we can help people recover their lives. I mean. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes it takes money. We we is. just we moved into headquarters, and that way I can launch a daily radio yeah. show, start doing a little bit of TV. We have a webcast that we want to inform our pastors so that we can do it right from one facility, and so that's what people would be helping us to accomplish. And, and let me tell you, I endorse what she's doing. <laughs> I mean, you. really, uh, we've had her, we know her, mm -hmm. we've followed her. Mm -hmm. uh, so please, if you mm -hmm. have an opportunity to use the resources God has blessed you with and that's what that's why we're given those resources yeah. is to do stuff just like this to say you know what God just touched my heart about this and I want to respond so take that website and make it happen Thank you, you say and these are your words as the American welfare state grew the American family collapsed it is so true and it's so underappreciated people look in the realities of uh, black communities now and scratch their head what happened well what happened was the social engineering of the 60s the great society the welfare engineering that said you don't have to think about your life anymore we have safety nets so the rules of welfare were don't work don't save don't get married and we'll just kind of keep you enslaved on this poverty plantation we built and it's unappreciated that the black family this is our case study 70% of black children during the 60s were raised in marital households. Today, 70% of black children are raised in single households. That wow. had nothing to do with slavery. It has nothing to do with Jim Crow. This is a direct uh, result of these Amazing. welfare programs. Amazing. And they're hurting all of society. Now the out of wedlock birth rate in the Latino community is 53%. The out of wedlock birth birth rate in the white community is almost 30 percent. When they started the social engineering in the 60s, white out of wedlock birth was 3 percent. Now it's almost 30 percent. We can't go on like this. Our families are totally collapsed. Mm -hmm. And when the family collapses, the whole community is in ruin. Society Education collapses. is that. It absolutely does. And that's why we're doing this work, because while 40 percent are government dependent, that 48 percent that are saying, what has happened? What, what is going on here um, are starting to re-engage themselves. Do people know? that they're being taken advantage of. I mean, mm -hmm. do, do people even realize it? Mm -hmm. The whole country now, in the last election cycle, started saying, wait a minute, what, what, when they saw the bloated budgets, all of a sudden we woke up and the Tea Party showed up because they became extremely concerned. But we didn't get here overnight. This has been going on since exactly. the 60s. And we're at that tipping point to where we are, actually, I've said a hundred times, we're right where Abraham Lincoln had to reach in the scriptures and say, a house divided can't stand. Yes. We have to make a decision. Yes. We're going to be all free are all slaves and we need to do that now we can't mm -hmm. be both we can't be half the country dependent and half the country um, you know just supply and the dependency yeah. did, did we ever think we would say seven uh, approaching 17 trillion debt it, in America did no we ever think that? no we're but we've become a debt society we've become a materialistic and narcissistic society when you think about even the the Adewella, 55 million dead babies. We are under judgment right now. When yeah. you look at abortion, we're, this is out of control. And what has to happen is we have to start peeling back and rescuing ourselves uh, from the debt. Uh, when you talk about the government debt, that's 16 to 17 trillion, that's individual lives. 70% of the money that comes into government coffers outside of the defense budget is a transfer to an individual. So That's every right. time you say, we're going to cut, we're directly affecting someone else's life. So what has to happen is we have to have real clear leadership and a surgeon. 
We have to someone that has a real heart for the need of the person that is getting that payment because we have promised our seniors that we're going to take care of them through their lives. Now they're approaching 80s and 90s and we're looking at a bankrupt system because we convince people not to have children. The pyramid has turned upside right. down. That's the right. entitlements are not going to be able to sustain themselves. And these politicians say, well, let's just increase their retirement age. Well, now you really hurt poor people because when you increase the retirement age, all you're saying is we're going to keep the money inside because we're hoping everybody dies before they get what they invested. Well, it's well, out of control. Yeah. You know, if I mean, we know you, so whenever we see you, we go running up to you. And <laughs> that high is high. true. I know. But, but if we didn't know you mm -hmm. and you were walking down a corridor in a hotel mm -hmm. like this, you think immediately, oh, she voted for President Obama right. and she's obviously a Democrat. Right. What is it with color right. that is that distinction between mm -hmm. Republican and Democrat? What's happened? Well, I think one of the things that happened is that the Republican Party did not look at the demographic shifts in this country and go sell their message. When you have ideas, they're just like products. You have to market them in oh, communities right. that um, perhaps are outside of your own if you want to make a sale. And what has happened is the Republicans took their eye off of these demographic shifts and these communities were becoming much more government dependent. The more we allowed this welfare society to go on, $600 billion a year, the more we did that, the more people became government dependent to where the now you look at the realities in black America 40 years after the social engineering, you have 25% that are just stuck in dependency. It, and the poverty rate stayed the same, you know, from the 60s to now. It's still 25%. It just kind of fluctuates up and down a little it's bit. So we've done nothing after We, think, after it, we think it's working. It's not working yeah. at all. Yeah. It's destroying whole families. Yeah. But what's really interesting and unique to now this particular community is their government dependent employment. The government is the number one employer of black men and the second largest for black women. Okay. So what's happened is they're not just Say voting there. The government is the largest employer of black men and the second largest employer of black women. So they're not voting their ethnicity, they're voting their economic sure they are. stability, sure they are. if you will. Well, sure they are. When they hear reduced government, they say, there goes my job. Exactly Just think right. logically. Who wouldn't? Well, the, everyone I mean, votes their economic interests, but because the media focus so much on the ethnicity of this president, it looks like they're voting for um, him because he's black. No, actually, the blacks have been more and more over time becoming Democrat. Remember that more African Americans voted for Nixon the first time he ran than for Kennedy the first time he ran. This is not. This is new in our community. Our heritage mm -hmm. and history is in the Republican Party. Wow. One of our heroes, uh, Frederick Douglass, said he was going to die a Republican because this represented this party represented freedom and progress, and it still does today. But the messaging has gotten lost. Yeah, you're right. We've it has disconnected from entire people's groups, and now they're all trending toward the Democrat Party. Go to that website if you want a mm -hmm. dynamic newsletter. Oh I yeah, you like my newsletter too. Great writer. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you. I write for Scripps News Service, so I've got a lot of practice. Well, once a week, my column is syndicated and, uh, and available to up to 300 papers in the country. So. Here, here's That's a copy right. out of it. Uh, you say, Republicans won't succeed by tiptoeing around America's crisis. Vision and values, that's, that's it. Right. Right. It's the same coin, and for anyone that pretends that they can have economic stability without family stability, it's just fooling themselves. There's just no way that you can have a whole lot of individual um, retiring alone and living alone and isolated individuals just trying to manage their own lives. They become much more government dependent, and, yeah. and Republicans of all should realize this. I think conservatives know it, uh, but the party has been taken over by a lot of more libertarian-minded people who um, believe in you know bootstrapping and individual Individual autonomy. There's a lot of rhinos in the Republicans. Yeah. Well, there's rhinos. There's an establishment that um, that you know will go either way. I think the real battle is for the Christian conservative to to push their values more deeply into this party and make sure that uh, we don't separate the economic issues from the social issues. Here's something we can move in on the, about the relationship between guns and slavery. Oh, Boy, you, you, you are right on. <laughs> well, you know but what I mean. That. <laughs> I went, I mean, I, you know, there's this perception of racism business yeah. out there. It's a whole industry yes. now. You know, I'm not dismissing that there are perhaps are uh, racists in our society, but there's this whole industry that has developed called the perception of racism, and it's sure. a billion dollar bu yeah. uh, business interest. And, we, and the names so, flashed to my mind immediately. Oh, who, certain ones. Oh, who's a part of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they shake down a whole lot of corporations. Yeah. In fact, when they shook down Toyota, they had to pay out like a 
450 million dollars just to keep them quiet and Nissan paid out about 650 million to keep them quiet so Goodness. you know they play the race card a lot that's, so I that's what the, you call extortion isn't well it would some people might call yeah. it that but I, I went to their playbook and I said you know what I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal a page out I'm gonna play the race card on this gun issue and one of the main reasons is because we've had gun control in our society before we had it when we saw the KKK. We had it when blacks and black codes did not allow for blacks to participate in the freedom of the Second Amendment. And what happened is the few took advantage of the many. Every person in the white community was not a member of the KKK, but you had these few ill-intended taking advantage of a very vulnerable people. So we felt that we, in this gun debate, we should go back into this history and show that we've already been down this road. We've had certain people targeted to take away their Second Amendment rights, and it wreaked havoc on that community. And if we as a society allow for the few powerful in Washington to take away all of our Second Amendment rights, it makes other people much more vulnerable. It's so just many, raw power, isn't it? It's all raw power. And we can look into other countries and see what happens. That's we can right. look into Cuba. We can look into Venezuela. We can go back to Hitler's Germany. You yes. know, he didn't only go after Jews. He killed a whole lot of Germans, too. So yes, we have to did. be very careful. And, you know, what's interesting on this gun debate is the... Um, the Prime Minister of, of Australia had the audacity to write our president to show imagine? to tell him how yeah. to do this in our society. And the New York Times printed this. But he mentioned something that a lot of people don't know. He said, I'm gonna tell you how to disarm your society. He said, but by the way, there's one little difference between us and you guys. We don't have a bill of rights. Well, in their constitution. Well, we do. So therefore, you're mixing apples and oranges, and we're going to fight you. Because if we don't protect the second, then there is no first. That's right. There's no first. And if there's no first, then there's no freedom of expression of religion. And we're already seeing that attack mm -hmm. against the Christian community. You know, now, gay history in our school. All, if the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? Yeah. I'm at the point where I think Hobby Lobby ought to just shut down. They should have a press conference like the Twinkie people and said, we're, we're out of here. We're not going to do this with you anymore. We're not playing your game of extortion anymore. And I think that the Christian community, Christian parents should say, we're not doing this to our children. And they should pull out overnight, just pull their kids out of these government-run institutions. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. it's amazing exactly what you have said. If we would band together as Christians, yeah. mm -hmm. we could put Hollywood out of business. That's right. I mean, with the liberals in Hollywood and all they want to hear from is progressive, progressive, legal. That's right. I, I mean, everything they want government to control right. our lives. They're driving us underground. And, and they're making movies yeah. to advertise their agenda. They're ju and they've been doing this for a long time. And at some point, we have to say, stop. That's mm -hmm. the line. You know, I'm looking at, I'm a Marriott member. Um, you know, their little club, because I stay in a lot of Marriott's because I travel a lot. Yeah. And to get here and see the news that they give to Planned Parenthood and they've been asked over and over and over not to, and they keep doing it anyway, I'm going to be writing them. I'm not pulling out, but I'm going to be writing them because we can't say, well, we're just not going to let society touch us anymore. It's everywhere. And Planned Parenthood is a billion dollar business. Billion dollar business. Why are we as taxpayers giving them $350 million a year, a billion dollar business? Yeah. This, is, this is a corporation. Every 94 seconds, Planned Parenthood kills a child. Every 94 yeah. seconds, the American taxpayers send them $1,600. Abortion doesn't even cost $1,600. I no. ought to know. I went into their so-called safe, legal, rare clinics yeah. and came out in a little black hole. This is a lie that we've bought. We've let it go on, on and on and on. And now we have major interests that are supposed to be leaning right thinking it's no big deal to give Planned Parenthood money. Yeah. The gay agenda is oh. controlling yeah, the networks. Yeah, I mean, it if is. you say anything, I mean, the one athlete just recently was, you know, they were talking about, hey, you've got gay mm -hmm. guys that are playing football. And he goes, right. we don't have that stuff in our, you know, know. and just, it was just, he was just jiving. Yeah. Got, got in such trouble right. that he had to go back before the cameras and, right. apologize. and apologize. Yeah, yeah. We're, at, we're at war. We're in a cultural war. Um, and I've drawn the, I've, I'm, I'm engaged in it. I said I'm going to do it. We're in a war. They've declared war on religion, so we have to fight. They've declared yeah. war on marriage, so we have to fight. And they've declared war on the poor, and so we have to fight. Wow. Mm -hmm. You're right. you, you, you say uh, Americans want bigger government according to the polls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you just kind of alluded to it right. because they're the greatest employer. Right. 
And right. I've heard, you live in Washington, D.C., right. that the properties there have no problem selling. Oh, no. And that, that it's all Boomtown. Of, yeah. yeah. That it, that Long Boomtown. lines at all of their new restaurants. I mean, it's oh, like, yeah. do you get party. it? Yeah. When I first came to Washington full time, you know, when you go in, I've been in and out of it for about 25 years. I've yeah. been in public life. And you go in and out, kind of like when you go on vacation, you think the place is really nice yeah. until you move there. And then you're like, oh, wow, where did yeah. this come from? Well, Washington uh, was like that for me. When I went out there about six years ago full time, uh, I saw interesting two people together because we all think that they're enemies, arch enemies. Yeah. And um, I asked my colleague about it. I said, um, wow, I didn't know that they even really would get along enough to be sitting over there drinking and carrying on and uh, winking at the cameras when and pretending that they're um, not on the same page. And he said, you know, there's this old saying here in Washington that politics is like professional wrestling. The conflict's for the crowd. At the end of the day, they're in the same business. And he went on to explain to me how their children grow up together. And he said, now think of children growing up together. When your children grew up with other children in their community, you got to know the parents. You went together to their games. You went together to their plays. And that's what's happened in Washington on both sides of the aisle. The only reason that we're not still seeing that scenario as vividly is because the Tea Party showed up a few years ago. When the Tea Party showed up, they had to put on a different type of face and they had to start singing a different tune. How long that will last, it depends on how long the Tea Party yeah. lasts and stays engaged. Well, they're fighting it. They don't like it. They don't like that. Well, they, they don't, but but notice what's happening. Each of their players are starting to feel the pressure of Washington. It's yes. an yes, establishment. It's yes. a game, and it's and it's business, too. Yeah. It's real business out yeah. there, and uh, and, and it's a, it, they have to stay engaged, though. Garfield, President Garfield, I mean, he was, he was the most shortest-lived president and, um, and wonderful uh, abolitionist. Uh, president, but he said that if we have corruption in Washington, it's because we tolerate it. Because the founders were so brilliant that they gave us a few things. Number one, they divided the government. But number two, they gave us term limits. They gave us the opportunity yeah. to weigh in every two years, every four years, every six yes, years. Yes. And we are the ones that are not That's exercising right. this. These people need to be fired, not a term limit to where they then decide that if they're tired of the Senate, now they can go to the House. And when they're tired of the House, they'll go become the mayor. And, and then they end up like in, in um, California, back in the governor's yeah. office. Brown. Yeah, we no, we need to fire them. Yeah. When you lose your job totally, no one rehires you. Yeah. Uh, and that's what has not happened in our political process. You know, it's amazing when you talk about even the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. We can enjoy the cuff, comfort and the prestige and power that they've been given. Mm -hmm. And if you get used to that, they start bending and turning and moving toward what we put them in there to fight against. Well, but here's the problem, because here's the problem. The people that put them there you, it, don't know all of why they put them there. You have a Tea Party candidate now who's there to just start cutting back on this horrible spending that has been going on in Washington for a long time. Some people, they say, they spend like drunkard sailors. No, yes. actually, drunkard sailors use their own money. <laughs> this is our money. But here's the it's dilemma. Good. When it's they good. say, well, let's cut things, then people in their constituency would say, well, well, not that. We don't want that particular thing cut. It's one of these, we hate Congress, uh -huh. but I like my congressman. We oh. hate the public schools, but I like my school. Yeah. And so it's impossible now to do business that way. You've got to, um, look what happened just with sequester. When you say, okay, we're just gonna do blanket cuts, Everybody comes to Washington. Every lobbyist, anyone and everyone that had a lobbyist license renewed that license to come to Washington to make sure that their interests weren't cut. Yeah. And uh, it's a challenge. We have congressmen who say that they're going home now, we're finished. They move from the, from the Capitol to K Street and they take their Rolodex with them. Many of the congressmen in our, in our um, nation's capital, their wives work as lobbyists in Washington. It's unbelievable Good. the yeah. party that has been going on there. Yeah. And so that's why the Tea Party has to stay energized, but be more clear on what it is they want. They remind me of what happened in black America. We knew what we didn't want, segregation. But after King's death, the enemy came in and convinced people that the new goal was forced integration and we lost track of what it was that we were fighting for. We were fighting for freedom, and now we find ourselves more enslaved and institutional. And that's what will happen to the Tea Party if they yeah. don't define why it is that we're here. What is our role in society? And if it's to reduce the size and scope of government, then let the politicians do their job and reduce the size and scope of government. Don't show up and say, but don't cut back. You just, yeah. you just talk like a prophet. 
because if they don't follow what you said, that's what it's going to be. Yeah. I, we see it already. We see it already. It's a, it's. We have to have discussions on entitlement reform. We have to. Yeah. Paul Ryan is right. We can't go on this way. We cannot sustain this program. But for everyone now to say, but I paid in it all my life and you're going to give me my return by golly, it's not an investment program. The Supreme Court ruled twice it's a tax. Mm -hmm. The Congress can change it at any time. So they can go in and say, well, for my constituents, we're just going to increase the retirement age. Well, for my constituents, we're just going to make the wealthy pay a little bit more. This is not a good idea. Anything the government gives you, they can take away. That's why we should own our retirement. We should start transitioning ourselves into President personal. President Bush tried, tried that. He that? Tried, but you know what? He did, and he thought he had a mandate. Yeah. But you ran into the constituents and say, ah, that sounds too yeah. hard. But yeah. we still have to do it. If we had done it 10 years ago, we probably would be in a different place. Where I thought that he should have focused more time and attention is instead of using age as the factor, which is what he did. If you're under 30, we'll transition yes. you. Yeah. He should use income. If you're under 30,000, because then you buy, you get oh, buy-in right. from you're the right. poor that people that are saying, we're the ones getting hurt that makes <laughs> the sense. hardest. You know, yeah. and so they then would be able to transition wow. real easily into personal uh, retirement and increase, um, you know, and increase their own net worth as well. Yeah. As I said at the beginning, you were on welfare at one time. Can you imagine now we're looking at 99 weeks? Yeah, unemployment, well, unemployment benefit. Yeah, the whole society is now saying, you know what, we're so we're tired of this game, so we're going to just play it too. So yeah. we're we're at a hor yeah. horrible place. But I think the good news is that Christian people are still. Um, Christian people. Yeah. I think it, yeah. one one thing that we know, especially from experiencing here at the NRB, is that there's a resolve in our leaders. This is our whole um, communications world here, and there's still a resolve saying we are going to engage this culture. We are going to get new methods and new ideas and share means and prayer and and, and song to, to to still try to win the day. And I think that we can be encouraged that at the end of the day, God still touches the hearts of men. When I look at my life, you're right, I was on welfare. But until those men looked me in my eye and pointed their finger in my face and said, your lifestyle is unacceptable, I would have probably continued in that. When they said, your life is unacceptable to God, I changed. Wow. And I think that that's still available I'm for people. I'm glad to end this uh, on good news. That's what we Salvation need to do. is still and available, is and that, and, and when sure somebody, that was somebody watching right it now. is. It's really available, especially on welfare. My goodness, that I tell kids all over this country: your fate, the set of circumstances that you were born into, is not your destiny. And we can capture destiny by receiving Christ. We can have Christ come in our life, and he will daily start showing you what to do. Set some goals, stay focused on them, not be distracted, and dream big. And he's still in that business. And I think that if we remind ourselves as Christians, and we keep doing what my pastor said one time at the church, he said, I know how we're going to win the culture war. We're going to just marry our children and have them have a lot of children. We'll just outnumber the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll just try to keep outnumbering the enemy and keep working against him. Yeah. Pushing back darkness. You can see the enemy with abortion oh, where uh -huh. he is wiped out. Can you imagine for 40 years yeah. over 55 million you human know, beings. I work in crisis pregnancy centers all across this country and I work with people and I always share my story and I always talk about abortion and not one time has someone not come up to me weeping who regrets the abortion they have. They won, one abortion, and the rest of their life is ruined as a result. They cannot forgive themselves. We are damaging people deeply. It has totally scarred us. Yeah. It destroys everything it touches, and yet we don't even want to talk about it. The opposition party that's supposed to give people light doesn't want to talk about it anymore. No Christians ought to fight for the heart and soul of the party of Lincoln and, our and Reagan. tax dollars okay. are contributing to oh, Planned Parenthood. $1,600 every, every 94 seconds. Go to that website, get this book. It is Uncle Sam's Plantation by Star Parker. You will love it, you will enjoy it, but support her ministry. God bless you. Bye-bye.